How you guys doing? CGF here once again with another Giants video. I have a video. I have content. Do you believe it? After a long weekend of Giants content, I have more content and I have something kind of unique and special. Today we're talking about fate. We're talking about the fate of three individuals on the New York Giants. We're talking about Daniel Jones. We're talking about the big man, Brian Gable. And we're talking about show Shane. And we're talking about how their three fates are currently intertwined. And how 2024 goes will most likely affect how those three individuals progress in the National Football League. But before I get going, please like, share, and subscribe. So it must be the spring. It must be my allergies. I've been sick as a dog the last day and a half with allergies. My skin's all broken out from all the trees opening here. And it's something about the spring. It always brings me back to my undergrad as an English major when we used to do Shakespearean sonnets and stories from the Victorian era, stuff that you guys probably would never read. I don't read that stuff. But this is a time of rebirth. It's a time of renewal. And the Giants just drafted six new players to their squad. And this time of renewal will eventually lead to the winter, okay? And in the winter of 2025, some big decisions will be made. Now, if Daniel Jones has a good 2024 season, it will be a continuance into the next spring for Brian Dable and Joe Shane. But if Daniel Jones flounders, he fails, the end will be near or nigh, or whatever you want to say, whatever, ever you want to say. Joe Shane and Brian Dable will need to find new jobs. And that's the thing that sucks, okay, to be quite honest. In the National Football League, it's a league of success, a league of results. And when you don't produce results, generally speaking, you lose your job. And when Joe Shane decided to extend Daniel Jones four year, $160 million contract, he put his name on it. He put that ring on that finger, okay? He joined a love triangle with Brian Dable as well. All three of them are in this love triangle, which could be a match made in heaven or it could be a match made in hell. But you can't just blame Daniel Jones. You got to look back at the draft classes. You know, we just had our final draft class of this year for Joe Shane. He made his picks. But if you look back at the players from the last three years, you see come kind of something. All right. So let's take a look. 2022. All right. We go back to Joe Shane's first season with the New York Giants. What stands out to you here about this draft class? Okay. Let's look at some of these players. All right. Giants had two top 10 picks. Pick number five and pick number seven. Pick number five, they drafted Kayvon Thibodeau. To this point, two seasons with the Giants, not bad. 15 and a half sacks. Can't say he's not been productive. He's been a pretty productive player. Evan Neal, on the other hand, it's been a different story for him. It's been a struggle. He's been injured. He's not performed to his level as a seventh overall pick. And there's questions about the fact they may move him over to guard. Wondell Robinson, his first season, he played in six games. He missed a lot of time with injury. But Wondell Robinson last season looked really good. He has almost 800 yards receiving with the Giants, three total touchdowns. So Wondell Robinson looks good. But then you look at the other guys on this list, okay? Josh Adudu, who the Giants put in. A little bit at left tackle. Remember, he had to fill in for Andrew Thomas. It was a disaster. The poor guy was crying in the locker room. He's another guy who's dealt with injuries, sadly. Cordell Flott, another guy. Another player who you picked in the third round. He's been a contributor. You can't say he's been terrible, but he hasn't been great either. One interception in two years. Can't say that's great. Daniel Bellinger, really good blocker. I guess you could say in 2022, when he went down with that injury, it really affected the Giants, that eye injury. He's been a really good player for a fourth-round pick. 
but he's not a pro bowler. I mean, he's a, he's a good tight end and he will be a contributor. Dane Belton, another guy. He's probably been one of the best performers for the Giants. Four interceptions to this point. Micah McFadden, a ton of tackles, but nothing really out of the ordinary. I mean, he's a decent fifth-round pick. DJ Davidson, not really that good. Marcus McKeithen has been injured at times. Darian Beaver, Beavers didn't even see the field last year. He got injured. Yeah, that was 2022. 2023, Deontay Banks had a good rookie year. It's tough coming in the league as a cornerback. And he's expected to be the number one cornerback this year. John Michael Schmitz, highly regarded. Giants were worried about the Bears drafting him. Came to the Giants, and he wasn't very good. He had a lot of struggles his first year. You blame it on him. You can blame it on scheme. You can blame it on communication on the offensive line, other players. But John Michael Schmitz, a guy who's highly regarded, you drafted in the second round, wasn't very good. Jalen Hyatt, electric player. How many touchdowns did he get so far for the Giants? None. Eric Gray could barely see the field. Trey Hawkins, the Giants tried to start him last season. Terrible PFF grade. Found himself on the bench. Jordan Riley couldn't get on the field. Javarius Owens was injured a lot. So you look at those draft picks, those two draft classes, and I'm not going to include, I'm not including this year's because it's way too early. Though there are plenty of people who have their criticisms. I was watching Talking Giants today during my lunch break, and they were talking about how they were really surprised that the Giants didn't go in the third round with an offensive lineman. And can't disagree with them. I really thought there were some players on the board that they should have considered over the cornerback, Phillips. I mean, Phillips is a guy that I felt was a little overdrafted. I felt like the Giants were putting themselves in a position because – they didn't sign any free agents. They didn't bring in any cornerbacks, any veteran help for quarterback two. They didn't resign a Dory Jackson. So they put themselves in a position where they had to pretty much go best player for a position in either the second or the third round. And we've seen this before. And I always joke about the Giants, how it's been their way of doing things is that they'll draft a safety or interior defensive player in the second or third round. And the player will be turned out to be pretty good, and they'll they won't want to resign them. And there's this argument: oh, you know, we could always replace another safety with another second round safety in three or four years, or whatever the case may be. But is that really the right way to build a roster? Could you draft a safety in the fifth round who could do an adequate job? I mean, I've seen the Giants grab safeties before at the end of the draft, undrafted free agents who were fine. I don't think safety should be as high a priority as it's been for the Giants. It really shouldn't be. I think when you're talking about premium picks, and what I mean by premium picks, the first three rounds, I'm not looking to draft a safety. That's one of the last things I should be drafting. You're drafting players that can make an impact. And the thing that really stood out to me in this draft was that the Giants didn't do anything in regards to the trenches, both sides of the ball. And we saw how this worked out before in 2023. The Giants decided that the only move they had to make was John Michael Schmitz. And last season was a disaster. Now, the Giants signed a whole bevy of players this offseason, free agents, guys that you hoped Runyon will come in. The tackle, the swing tackle from the Raiders. You hope, you hope these guys will come in and add some needed depth. Gives an upgrade. They hope that Carmen Brasillo is another guy who's going to come in and magically transform the Giants' offensive line. A line, although a lot of people like to blame quarterback play, but a line that was historically bad last year. And then you talk about the defensive line. And I know Shane Bowen's scheme is different than Wink Martindale's. I understand that. But I'm not going to talk about Brian Burns or Kayvon Thibodeau or Aziz Ojolari because I consider those guys more perimeter threats. I'm talking about beef in the middle of the defensive line. Besides Dexter Lawrence, who do we have? We didn't spend any resources on improving that. I've watched so many Giants games over the last couple of years where they continuously get gashed in the center of the defensive line. How's that going to change? I mean, we got to face Saquon Barkley now twice. <laughs> you know, it's not going to be a walk in the park for the Giants. 
Brian Robinson's another good running back. The good old Ezekiel Elliott's back with the Cowboys. I just think that I've never been the guy who's just going to give people benefits of the doubt. I'm trying to, you know, you see my post last couple of days on, on Twitter. I try to say, give these guys a chance, give Daniel Jones a chance, give Dable and Shane a chance. And I'm going to do that. But I also need to say how I feel. And I feel that those three are intrinsically tied to each other. And I'm telling you, I mean, I was looking at for preliminary the teams after the draft today, I was looking through, taking a look at who's improved themselves. And right now, the Giants are a big question mark to me. I would not feel comfortable saying more than six wins right now. And that is being very conservative. And, and the thing is this, is that I want the Giants to be good. But there's just too many question marks, okay? There's too many question marks about this team. And it, it sucks to have to talk about that. It sucks to have to even think about that. But as I just showed you, there, there's this I, – I don't know if it's, it's a Shane thing where he thinks, oh, I, I didn't need to even consider adding any beef on either side of the line that, oh, the guys I have is good power good enough. That sort of arrogance has led us to problems before. You know, if you see a guy that's sitting on a board that's really good, regardless of position, if it's, if it's not a safety, you know what? Go for it. Go for it. Listen, I, I have no idea how this draft class is going to turn out. It usually takes about two to three years. But at the end of the day, three years from now, you want these guys to be contributors. You want these guys to be on the field. And I just showed you that 2022 draft class. You know, we just looked at this. How many of these guys are, are consistently on the field for the Giants? And the meat of any roster, generally speaking, is the middle to the bottom of the roster. That's where you get your role players. That's where you get guys who are contributors. And a lot of these guys, if you look at these numbers, sack numbers, interception numbers, they're not good. So, yeah, I mean – I hate to be negative and I try not to be, but I think there needs to be a little bit of understanding. So getting back to the whole thing about fate, okay? The fates of Brian Dable, Joe Shane, and Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones, unfortunately, fair or not, Brian Dable, Joe Shane, fair or not, their fates are all intertwined right now. And I'm going to be honest, it's going to be an uphill battle for all three of them. If you were a Vegas odds bookmaker, if I was going to take 100 bucks to Vegas right now and there was a bet that I could make saying, do you believe Daniel Jones, Joe Shane, and Brian Dable will be back for the start of the 2025 season? I would take the no on that. I would say no, they're not going to be back. I hope I'm wrong. I, I hope I'm sitting here and I hope I'm wrong. But I, I, just, I, I just think there's – and I don't know if it's just an organizational thing. Because I went over this with you guys. It's been three GMs. It's the same issues. There is a major issue with roster construction with the Giants. And it's been going on since 2009. I don't know if they became complacent after winning their fourth Super Bowl in 2011. But if you just kind of follow a line from, and I brought up that draft with Terrell Thomas and Mario Manningham, if you, in 2009 onwards to now, and that's what, 15 years? The U.S. have hit on a couple of players. And I know some somebody came out and said today, because I said, really, there's not many Hall of Fame-worthy players from that, in that time period from, on the Giants' part roster. And people said, oh, yeah, there are a couple probably. Let's look at it, okay? Eli, for sure. Justin Tuck, perhaps. Dexter Lawrence, maybe in the future. Andrew Thomas, maybe in the future. But besides that, OBJ. OBJ really had a good start with the Giants, and then he tailed off. I mean, he made a Super Bowl, won a Super Bowl. But... I mean, who else are you going to say? Chris Nee, maybe? I mean, the Giants don't have historical talent. You look at teams like, let's use a, use a, for example, the Baltimore Ravens. They're like a factory turning out above average to elite talent every year and year out they do that. And I think that's a systemic problem with the Giants. And it's not a Shane issue and it's not even a Gettleman issue or a Reese issue. It goes all the way back. So. I don't know, guys. What do you think? I, I just think that this fan base needs something good to think about because 
I, I already know. I already can see what's going to happen. And, and and the real key is this. And the fate. You want to talk about fate? You know how fate could really help those three individuals if they get a favorable schedule. Because in less than a month, we will know the New York Giants schedule for 2024. And it really is dependent on the fates of the schedule makers. How advantageous, how fortunate the Giants will be. Because we saw in 2022 how a good schedule could really help out the Giants. And then we saw last year how a bad schedule could really hurt the Giants. Do the Giants get another terrible schedule? Or do they get a break? Do they catch a break? I think they have an extra home game this year, which should help. But at the end of the day, as a Giants fan, I'm tired of, of these videos of negativity. Like, And I guess people would, would say in the comments, you know, CGF, you're not helping the situation. I guess you could say that. But who's going to talk about it? Who else is talking about this stuff? Now, who else is talking about the fact that the Giants' second, third round picks for the last 15 years have been terrible? Who else is talking about the fact that Joe Shane obviously is a bit cocky and a little bit arrogant, I guess you could say, in the fact that he didn't think that he needed to improve the offensive line talent? And it's not like we got – Pro bowlers. It's not like we signed a bunch of pro bowlers who have been relatively healthy. We, we signed a couple of guys who are kind of questionable. Aaron Stinney. You no, know, John Runyon for the guards. Eleanor for a tackle. I'm not saying he's going to be bad. I'm not saying any of these guys going to be bad. But we know our track record. We saw what happened with Mark Lewinsky. We saw what happened with Nate Soldier. There's been time and time again we've signed offensive linemen. And – they suck or they go somewhere else and they become good. <laughs> How many times have we seen that? Giants will let guys go and they'll go to other teams and they'll wind up being good. I've seen that happen way too many times. I don't want to see it anymore. <laughs> Even so with Eric Flowers, Eric Flowers left the Giants, wound up going to Washington and actually was decent for a little while. And I never thought I'd say Eric Flowers being a decent player, <laughs> but Come on, this has happened before. So hopefully the fates of those three individuals, will the fate will smile upon them. Because if it doesn't, we're going to be switching over again next year and we'll have another press conference with a whole bunch of new faces, a whole bunch of new promises about new Giants football, play tough, smart, and dependable. 60 minutes, we're going to punch you in the mouth. And all, all the euphemisms that have been used over the last decade and a half. And then we're going to be sitting there. It's going to be another 6 and 11 or 5 and 12 and picking in the first 70 picks. And we're like, well, what the hell, you know? <laughs> the Cowboys kick our ass. The Eagles kick our ass. And then soon Washington's going to be kicking our ass because they're getting better. And they don't have a dysfunctional ownership group anymore. So, yeah, we'll see what happens. But right now, as a fan, at least my perspective is that I'm going to try my best to support Shane Dable and Daniel Jones. And at the end of the day, you hope that they get things right and we have a good year. We make the playoffs and maybe go on a little run, perhaps surprise some people. Because right now, I think the Giants, the thing going for them right now is that no one expects them to be good. And that could be. A very dangerous thing for the rest of the league because if someone doesn't think you're good and you come out and you're a Houston Texans or a Cleveland Browns. Last year, they were surprising. Could the Giants be that team? Don't know. Please like, share, and subscribe if you like this content. Love you guys. Talk to you soon.